Our next speaker is Mark van Bavel. He's the Executive Vice President, Digital Platform Architecture within the Global CTO Office at NTT Limited. The topic of his presentation is Global Merger Combined with Digital Transformation Using Enterprise Architecture as Strategy. So over the past 20 years, Mark has had numerous roles from client consulting to leading internal platform and digital transformations as Chief Architect, where he globalized the Dimension Data Service Delivery Platforms, as Group CIO, where he standard Dimension Data, to Quote to Cash, Global Template, and ERP, and Group CDO, where he modernized the front office and established global enterprise architecture function across the enterprise end to end. Hi everyone, my name is Mark Van Barvel and thanks for that introduction. I'm the Executive Vice President of Digital Platform Architecture at Entity Limited, and I'll be talking about our experience of using enterprise architecture as strategy to frame our global integration and our global transformation that we are currently undergoing. So in 2019, we created Entity Limited out of 34 companies that Entity owned globally. Some of these were global companies, while others were local companies. And we brought them together to create one experience for our clients, but also to create efficiencies and operating uh, cost savings across the duplication of these companies. So we formed these companies into an operating model as follows. At the top, we have divisions, and that's really our products and services that we deliver globally. And there are multiple companies we brought together into those divisions. And then the other, at the below, you can see the countries and the regions. And that's really the sales channel to take the divisional products through to our clients. Now, each one of these companies in their own had their own sales, for example, or their own products. So we had to move people from the top to the bottom and vice versa. And we have to, within those different groups, integrate those companies, but across the whole organization. At the same time we're integrating, we're modernizing uh, to move with the market. So if you look at where we were with our customer experience, our customers had to log on to multiple different portals, there were many websites, lots of branding, lots of IVR systems and call centers to call for service. Uh, to over 27 different portals to log on, 15 email addresses, and a multitude of B2B integration APIs for them to connect to. And then behind that, we had different groups with different processes delivering that interaction to our clients. And behind that, these different groups with different products, and they, they themselves are fragmented with different databases and systems and processes. And if you look at the quote to cash from that channel that I spoke about, the countries, to the division, the products, um, for every division and for every country, we had manual processes between them and many processes in the quote to cash. And if you multiply it out by all the different divisions and all the channels, you can see a very big n squared problem. So as you can imagine, this is a big, big challenge to resolve uh, and enterprise architecture and the way we modeled this was key to be able to understand the complexity and to come up with a portfolio of plans. So together with that, as I mentioned, we wanted to achieve a digital ambition. And what we mean by that is really two things. So one is optimization of our business. So over here, you can see we're looking to get more productivity out of existing business, um, improve the profitability, also introduce new operating models uh, to better service our employees and our customers. And so that's digital optimization. A lot of that's focused around automation, integration, rationalization of systems. And then the other side is really to transform because our market and where we're working is changing so rapidly that we have to launch products and services very dynamically and we have to be able to use different business models in how we sell those products, more in a consumption type model. So we've got this dual problem. And so as you could see, a big challenge with integration combined with a big challenge of modernization um, in a competitive market. It's like flying your airplane while trying to change the engine while you're flying. So our ambition is to get to the state by 2023, starting with our client engagement and getting that one client experience for our customers. Then our employees, we want our, our employees are knowledge workers. And we don't want them doing mundane and repetitive type tasks. So as much automation, digitization, and things like RPA automation that we can put in place to make their lives easier and more productive. Then we want to optimize our operations. So we're moving from all these fragmented siloed companies with duplicated services like everyone doing accounts receivable 
to really trying to standardize those processes and move them to a lower cost geography in a shared service type of model. And then lastly, we want to transform our products and services in terms of creating that ability to launch um, products globally immediately uh, and having a far more agile environment. But in getting to this form of digitization that we envision, we have to address a lot of challenges along the way in our value chain and so on. And so we had lots of different sources of data. They were not integrated, very non-connected and incoherent. We had delays in resolving problems between companies uh, because of a lack of integration understanding. So hence the customer experience suffered. We had disconnected tools and pre which prevented collaboration across the organization. It was hard to sell off a standard catalog, for example. So our salespeople struggled to sell the full portfolio. Uh, it is hard to find the right people, the right information, the right tools. It is all in silos everywhere and hard to discover. And we had fragmented systems with duplication and poor procurement. So that was our current state. A lot of problems to solve in 2019. So to start with actually understanding and unpacking this, we built what we call a business capability model. So that's an enterprise ar uh, architecture artifact that des describes the what the business needs to do. Um, and generally, it's quite a stable model where the how, where, and when is something that changes all the time. And so this model is a capability model that allows us to prioritize our decisions and enable us to have a language where the IT and the business partner are talking the same language. And we utilize the language from the business partner. And this allows our business partner to express our business capabilities in a way that support their goals and strategies and to stop thinking in terms of technologies and technical solutions, but rather focus the conversation and outcome on what we need to, to sorry, on what we need to solve uh, and not what they think the perceived problem is. So you're elevating the conversation to much more of a process uh, conversation and outcome conversation versus a technology and solution conversation. So over here, you can see our model got five key domains and in it 20 blocks. Those are our level one domains. And then below that, we've got a much more detail, which I'm not showing you here, which goes to level two and to level three. So within those five key domains, um, these were the number of applications we uncovered. And as you can see, they're a large number. So you can see on, can see on the end, uh, ERP, we've got 47 platforms. We had 125 payroll systems. Um, about um, 25 HCM systems and so on. And it's hard to run a global business and get real-time visibility of what's happening when your data is fragmented across these core systems. So in order to map out our vision of where we were and where we want to be, we built a blueprint. This blueprint, we started with that business capability model. And then we had interviews with these 34 companies and we found out all the applications that we could and we mapped it to those capabilities. So we did a discovery and we ended up with about 2,040 um, odd applications across those uh, 34 brands. And it happens also to have been 56 separate architectures because some of the global companies were themselves fragmented and hadn't integrated into one global entity. Now, so from there, uh, we then mapped um, the different applications to the capabilities. And what you can see here is essentially a heat map with different perspectives. On the far side, you're seeing, for example, rewards management. It's got 86 different rewards management applications. Therefore, we highly fragmented, which is why it's showing up as orange there. But then on the middle column, you're seeing a green with 11. That basically means that we've got some applications that are common across the companies. And so this is one method of using the capability model as a tool to understand where you've got variation in the business, duplication, or where you've got some commonality. Next, we also looked uh, against the capabilities against each company. What is the life cycle of the technology supporting that business capability? So is it recently deployed? Is it currently in use? Is there a plan to replace it? Is it technical debt? And when you acquire companies, often they want to sell it at maximum value and they want to make it as profitable as possible. And companies at that phase often stop investing in IT and they build up technical debt. So over here, you can see a couple of companies compared with each other um, and all in different life cycle. And then finally, out of that, we came to a map of our recommended roadmap of technology. So what are the core platforms that we plan to use uh, and what is our North Star so that people know where we're going and they can make decisions along the way towards that North Star. So once we'd done that detailed analysis and came up with our application blueprint, which I just showed you, uh, we went back to all of those companies 
um, to talk about this is where we're going, this is where you are today. When do we think over the next five years, based on our strategy, will we migrate from your current application to the new application? So that's very much a portfolio view. It's not a detailed project view. And in that process of going back for the second round of detailed analysis, we started capturing all the contracts because you can't get the benefit of rationalizing the application until the contracts run its life and you avoid the next renewal. Uh, and with all that contract information, we start getting a total cost of ownership of all of this duplicated uh, real estate and applications out there. So the next thing is that we are reviewing and finalizing the sequence of how we would move from the current state of applications to that future state. And so here you can see an application migration roadmap. And in particular, in the roadmap, we're capturing the month and the year that we think uh, best effort that we believe we will migrate. And then we can see the cost and the cost savings per year based on that rationalization of those applications and map that out into a roadmap that you see here that really shows our total application rationalization over five years. And per year, it's actually indicating how many applications we have in the circles and how many we're removing just below the circles. And so you can see over here for corporate IT, we start with 1,833 applications and we're moving down to 916 over five years. In reality, we'll go much further down than that, but this is what we have planned in our portfolio tool. So this is very complex to do. And so what we've done to actually capture all this information and interdependencies is put that into an IT enterprise architecture portfolio management tool uh, so that we can track it in a database and we can also then get various business owners to own their area of the business so they update the database on a continuous basis as and when, when we change dates of rollout or we change technologies. But how we communicate it is, I, I use this architectural journey uh, diagram here, which is work that comes from Ross, Will and Robinson from uh, Harvard Business School, which is a model I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And with this model, what we have done is we have mapped our business across it. So on the left hand side, you're seeing each individual company in its own bubble. It's thinking locally optimized. It's functionally optimized for its own business, but it's not part of a global organization. Normally, the first thing you do is you standardize technology because that doesn't impact the processes of the different organizations, but you get some efficiency gains like a common PC build or a common data center environment where you host all the applications. Next is that you go to the optimized core. So here we're looking to standardize your commodity or your non-differentiating processes so that you can outsource them or put a shared service in place. And in, that, do, in doing that, you build up what we call a system of record platform. So basically a global ERP, if you like, um, which allows us to, again, reduce our cost of operations, our, our GNA costs, but also is a stepping stone towards a digital business where you start then overlaying with systems of engagement and systems of intelligence, which is that final state in the journey that we want to get to. Now, that's a multi-year journey. It's not a simple change. And all the companies that were formed when we created NT Limited in uh, July 2019 were at different phases, as you can see here, of this journey. Some had already been on a globalization journey of this nature for many years, and some were just local country-specific companies. Uh, and some were fragmented or federated companies that hadn't started the journey. But when we formed Entity Limited, we all moved back to the left. So we all silos compared to each other. And that was day zero, 1st of July, 2019. So in our first year, we focused on that standardized infrastructure. And because we had so many overlapping IP addresses between these 34 architectures and so on, we modernized our infrastructure to a software defined infrastructure where you decouple your layers. So you move into the cloud, you go to SD-WAN, but you also, importantly, the connectivity from the user to the application and user to user gets decoupled from the network with systems like SAS eSolutions. So we built the standard infrastructure and we moved all the countries on it first, and then we built this overlay reporting system. Next, we started moving onto the standard infrastructure, those divisions, and we started building out our standard digital platform um, which will be our future single platform with global marketing, global sales platform, global HR, global finance, reporting and master data. And very much started with the key global companies first getting onto that. And the last platform you see on the far side, that is really our global digital services platform to unify the client experience for our service delivery. So you can see three platforms here, and these are our three core digital platforms. 
software defined infrastructure platform, our standard digital global database, our system of record, and the far right is our digital experience platform for our customers and employees. And so we're at stage two right now. Um, we're finishing up stage two towards uh, another six months. And then we're moving into stage three, which is basically moving more of the companies from the left to the right across this maturity, ultimately to get everybody across all of these four, sorry, these three core platforms. So a blueprint to realization. What, what do we take out of this? So over here, you see a slide around centered on business capabilities, which is a representation of our business anchored anchor model, independent of the structure, processes, people, or domains. So the what and not the how. So zooming into that capability model once more. So behind this model, we then mapped out the technologies that will enable that model. So here's a high level view of our blueprint. It goes into a lot more detail, but it gives you that digital North Star, if you like, of where we're going. Then we built the roadmap as I talked about already. And if you double click a roadmap, for example, I'm taking market engagement and customer relationship, and I double click into that, you can see it's now broken down into the core level one domains, marketing management, sales management, deal management, and so on. And talking a bit more at the, that level of detail, how those particular domains will evolve and simplify over time and towards what standard architecture. Then double clicking into, as an example, sales management domain, and you can start seeing some of the sub level three, level two uh, business capabilities, talking about what we're trying to achieve at the business and at a platform strategy. And then this is now the, the lowest level of our business capability map, mapping what technologies will enable the sales environment. And then flipping that over, if you look at the technology, what capabilities is that technology enabling? And then we've got to go to execution. So on this slide, what you basically see on the top is our current sales divisions strategy. What are they trying to do? And then the business capability is the bridge between the strategy and the execution. So what projects at the bottom are we prioritizing? And really helps translate that link. And when you look at the actual roadmap of sales of the implementation in this year, again, you see the capabilities. Are we then tracking what projects are enabling what business capabilities at what point in time? And are we meeting those? And right at the bottom, you can see what applications are we decommissioning because we have rolled out the global capability now and we can remove the local business capabilities. And over here is just an example of how we're decommissioning our applications. That really is it. It's the common language between IT and business to assess the gaps and overlaps. Uh, it's a basis of discussion and planning and to link strategy to execution. A few more examples of how we use the business capability model. Uh, in this case, here's our model again, um, and we can convert that model to map it to our uh, target operating model of the business. So what capabilities are enabled where? Which ones are in the countries? Which ones are in global divisions? Which ones are going to be delivered through shared services? Which ones are really strategic at a group head office level? And what other shared services will we develop? So this slide, not the prettiest slide, but this slide is actually a slide from our business. So our business adopted an enterprise architecture tool, in this case, the business capability model. And here, what they've been using it for is to well, over here, basically, you can see it's broken down to more levels of details, actually a spreadsheet that I'm showing you. And they've now mapped it then to what organization, group, region, division. They've also then mapped it to what category or value stream is that capability supporting. Uh, they also mapped it to the area that we want to focus on in terms of automation and digitization. And then importantly, what areas we want to map, what capabilities we believe are commodity that we can outsource or put into a shared service. And so very much they've mapped everything at a level two level and formulated the strategy of how we're going to build our new operating model. Another example that we've used in our business is a heat map to prioritize. In this example, I'm actually showing an industry capability model, not our own internal one. And I'm showing you one from the TSIA, which is the industry for technology services. And here we've heat mapped where we were um, against those capabilities. Now what's important here is that the Technology Industry Association also maps where the market is. And so the market may not be mature in a particular capability, which means we don't have to be bleeding edge in everything. We, might, we, need, we just need to be at least as good as the market. And so then we map out into the detail, what are we going to do to close those capabilities? So the as is and the to be and the roadmap. And then all the initiatives that we need to actually execute 
ultimately to get to our final 2B heat map. And there you can see not everything's green by design, but at least we've got an easy way of communicating through heat maps uh, what our roadmap is and what our initiatives are to close those gaps. Another key thing about it, as I mentioned, it changes the language with our business partners. So in a traditional architecture and a traditional environment, you, you've got a high degree of coupling between your infrastructure, your application information model, your access and your user. And so you start thinking in terms of technologies, functions and features. But when you start breaking those layers, and that, and that is possible in today's technology, so you're virtualizing your infrastructure, you are enabling your applications through initially data APIs, process APIs, experience APIs. You're publishing these as services. You're orchestrating that then with digital process automation and different systems of engagement. You can now talk about a business capability as something you want to enable and then work backwards how you're going to do that through this architecture. Uh, so for example, you might want to do order status management and that might involve many systems, many ERPs below, but you can actually decouple all of that and create one screen for the user uh, to operate across all of that. And so by decoupling the layers of the architecture, it gives you more flexibility and removes dependencies so you can do different things at different speeds. Lastly, um, just to summarize, so the business with the business operating model, the strategy, the organizational description, the value streams, um, they describe it in, in that format. Technology, we've got the infrastructure, software, data, reference data models, and so on. And connecting the business with the technology, that is the gap that we have. And we need a stable framework uh, that reflects the relationships because the business environment changes faster typically than a technology environment. And that's really the focus area of alignment where we put the capability model. It's the linkage between that strategy and the technology. So our journey, just in summary, um, we built our strategy, what we're gonna do, why we're we doing it, our vision. We then built our business model, our operating model and our capability model. Then from there, we went into our enterprise architecture and our roadmaps and what we want to achieve over time for our 2B. We're then executing that in several platforms, systems of record, systems of engagement, digital infrastructure and digital workplace. And then finally, we've got the whole transformation very focused around initially the as-is business process management and KPIs and then measuring because if you don't measure strategy, you won't execute strategy. So that's a key element and change management. So key takeaways, data-driven decision-making is necessary. In such a complicated environment, you've got to collect this data into a platform, a portfolio management tool, um, the level of due diligence you do on the data gives you a lot of insight, but also removes arguments in the business as to what you need to do, because you've got the backing, you've got the information. The capability model uh, is a starting point to frame that information gathering. Uh, it's also a common anchor to execute, and various architectural views and roadmaps are linked back to that model as the anchor. Gathering this information and dealing with so many organizations, there's a lot of politics involved, people's jobs changing, all that stuff. So every business has to have something to contribute. You need to find those nuggets of gold and so they can see something in the 2B architecture that represents them uh, and that you're being impartial, which is a very important aspect uh, in buy-in. And then constant business partner engagement. If you're just an order taker from business and you're working in a silo, you're not gonna be successful in such a big transformation. You need to constantly engage and review with business and they need to own that architecture, own the business model, which is why the capability model needs to reflect their language. And then you've got to decouple your architectural layers. There's so much complexity. If one aspect is delayed, for example, data center consolidation, you don't want that to impact your ERP consolidation. So you really have to focus, how can you decouple the layers uh, and remove dependencies? And lastly, you need a clear target operating model. The clearer the operating model, the clearer the execution and the change management and, and the prioritization of how you get there. And so with that, uh, I thank you for uh, listening and uh, hopefully our journey at NT Limited was of interest in terms of how we used enterprise architecture as strategy for our transformation as well as our digitization. Thank you. Mm -hmm.